Hey guys, how's it going tonight? You know, I've never used one of these before. It's kind of weird. I feel like I'm, I don't know, like uh, these speakers that are like giving you all this advice and stuff. But um, I looked you up this this morning. I saw that Jimmy Buffett was going to play at um, the Belly Up. This is making me think about you know singing and stuff. And man, I went to try and get those tickets, and it was only like an hour and a half later, and um, they're gone. So that was a bummer. Um, hey, it's great to see so many of you guys here. Yeah, my name is Brian Hardy, and I work with a group of people here um, building some React-based widgets. And these widgets, they have some core and common um, functionality that is something we want to reuse all over into it. And so because they get used across our ecosystem, these widgets get uh, put into place in a lot of different ways in a lot of different environments. And so testing is important to our group. And so um, I'm going to share with you some of our experience uh, with testing and the, and the things that we've tried to do. So I don't know that we're experts at it, but, but we're, getting, we're getting better and better at it. And um, it can be difficult and challenging. And so I just wanted to share our experience with you and see if I can help any of you to, to do testing better. A lot of the people in our group when, you know, that were younger or just starting, they didn't really want to write the tests. So I always hear, why write tests? Why write tests? And so this slide kind of you know, is hitting that. It's like, here's these robots here. Oh, no, the robots are killing us. But why? We never programmed them to do this. Of course they didn't. But look at mayhem ensues. People are being killed, disembodied. Human population is being annihilated. And why? Why? Look at this code here. Static bool. Is crazy murdering robot equals false? That's good. Good. False. And then we have a function. Interact with humans. If is crazy murdering robot, kill humans. Else be nice to humans. Be kind. So that's good. But let's see. Oh, oh no. They did a single equal. So rather than testing to see if the robots were crazy, they're actually turning them into crazy murdering robots. And as Donald Trump would say, not good, bad, very bad. Sorry to you, Trump supporters. Um, but anyway, yes, testing is important. It's important. And you should do it. And it's fun, too. So tonight I want to talk to you, like I said, about what we're doing for testing. And there's many different types of tests. And I wanted to just set this in boundary what we're going to be talking about. We're going to be talking about unit testing tonight. Um, unit testing is something that, as developers, we should all do. That's something we need to do. It's part of your responsibility writing code. And as you can see in this diagram here with this pyramid, unit tests are kind of the base of testing. And so unit testing is about like a small unit of compilation or a component, a module, something small that you write. And you want to test to make sure that that component um, does what it's supposed to. And so you can write tests for it. And then if you start to chain some of those units together to see how they're working together, you're going more into integration testing. And if you're testing your system from end to end, maybe that's more you know, end to end testing. And you can do some automation and some Selenium type tests. But we're going to be focused on unit tests um, in this talk. Um, there's functional testing, load testing, all sorts of testing. But tonight, we're going to look at unit testing. So what are some of the benefits of unit testing? There's a lot of different benefits. And these are just some that I put together here. Find problems early, yes. Active writing test often uncovers designer implementation problems. Yes, I found that to be true for myself a lot of times. It helps me to write better code. Serve as documentation. Yeah, absolutely. You can go and look at those unit tests, and you can understand how you're supposed to interact with other people's modules. They simplify integration, and they facilitate change. These are really important to me. This is why I really like unit testing and tests in general, because I like to have a broad base of tests covering our application. So especially when you're working with you know, a, a team of individuals, it gives the opportunity for people to go in and uh, refactor things or add functionality, fix bugs, whatever. But as long as you have those unit tests in place, you can feel more confident that your software isn't going to break when people are changing it. It also gives you the, the confidence to go in and say, hey, let's try this thing. Let's change this thing make something different in our software, you can do that because you have this base of tests. If you have a lot of them and you feel like they're well-written tests, um, you feel like you, know, you, can, you can go and change the code without worrying that you're going to break a whole bunch of stuff. 
So it's important, and it is the responsibility of developers to write tests. But like I said, um, there's a lot of different ways to do testing, and um, I'm just going to talk to you about the things that we've come across and how we're doing it. Uh, I was going to talk to you about the tools that we use. These are pretty common things. We use Mocha as a test runner, and we use the Chai assertion language. Um, we use Sanon for mocks and stubs and spies, and I'll get into this more. Um, we use Karma as another test runner, and we use the React test utils for testing the virtual DOM in React. And we use another uh, framework called Unexpected React that we really like. I'll show you more detail about that later. But um, the Chai assertions, there's two kind of flavors. There's expect and there's should. So you can see in this example up here, we have a, some constant, my value was 22. And so we can make an assertion, expect my value to equal 22. And as long as my value is 22, um, that will pass. Um, should is another variant that I like. I think it just reads more like English. And when things read properly and sound properly in English language, I feel like they're designed well and they work well. So I just like should a little better. But you know, it's my value should exist. My value should equal 22. Um, here's a, a variable constant search bar. And um, you can have a, an assertion here that search bar should have a function with the name filter. And then just, uh, just to show you, here's one at the bottom about <clears throat> should not exist. So you can't take the variable and say should not exist because it's null or undefined. So you have to sort of do it backwards. Should dot not exist some null value. So like I said, we use the Mocha test um, runner. And uh, we use the behavior driven development interface. That's the one I'm most useful. I know they have like four, but this is the one I use mostly. Um, the API has these different uh, entry points. Describe is for uh, describing a suite of tests, and it represents a single test. And um, then before and after are things you can do for your suite of tests. You can get some data prepared, and then when the suite of tests is over and after, you can tear that down. And sort of analogous, we have before each and after each, and those can be used with single tests. So, all these tests, these unit tests, are meant to run uh, independent of each other. They should never depend on another test. And so, like, if you use before each, maybe you set up and initialize some data that you want your test to run and modify that data and make sure something happened. And then the next test is going to run. It initializes that data again with the before each. So before each is something really great to get your data initialized, get things ready for the test that you might change parts of the data and make sure things happen the way you expect. So here's just a simple test, putting this all together, where we're getting, um, we're getting our chai assertions with should. And we have one test here. It says, it should confirm that 1 is greater than 0. And then uh, this is ECMA 1.6. But we have a function here. We have a value that is equal to 1. And then we're just making an assertion. This value should be above 0. And if 1 is above 0, then this test will pass. So I like this test because it reads, again, like English. It says, it should confirm that 1 is greater than 0. It's real easy to read that and know what it's supposed to do. I like to sometimes do test-driven development. I don't always do it, but it's kind of fun. And um, it's nice when you, you're building something, and you can go in and create statements like these. I'll say, it should confirm that 1 is greater than 0. And I'll put a parenthesis and a semicolon. And if I run that, it'll just be a skipped test. So if I make some kind of component or module, I might list out all the things I think it's going to do, and I just list them out so they're all skipped. And I can read it in English. It's like I'm writing down my acceptance criteria. And then I might go and start to fill in the test for what I think should happen, and then I'll write the code to meet that. And I just do one after another, and the next thing you know, the whole thing's done, and I know it does all the things I wanted it to do. Kind of cool. It's a good feeling. Um, but here's another, here's another example, and this is just showing describe, where we're going to have a suite of tests. Um, the suite is named a group of tests, and it has the same test we had before, and it has another one in here. It should confirm that 2 equals 1 plus 1. So if this was in a file, myfile.js, you could run this on the command line, you know, mocha, myfile, mytestfile.js, and it'll run. It tells you what, what group of tests it's running, and then it shows you each test as it runs it. And if it fails, it gets a green check. And if it, if it dies, it's some, some kind of red X or something. It gives you uh, information about what went, what went wrong. 
So some more details about Mocha. Um, if you have a lot of tests, you have a lot of suites of tests, and you want to um, maybe focus on one, you, or, or, not, or, or ignore one that's having some problems for the time being, you can use the word skip, the keyword skip. You can also use that on, on a particular test itself to skip a test. Maybe it's not passing and you want to come back to it later. Um, likewise, there's another uh, keyword only, so you can use only with a suite of tests or with one single test. And this is really helpful. I've found when I've got tests that for some reason, I didn't realize it, but the tests are maybe inadvertently changing something or using some data somewhere, which they shouldn't be, and another test is relying on it, and then they fail, or there's some kind of timing thing. So you can kind of like hone in on that by you know, doing only and running tests and making sure everything runs by itself, and then you slowly introduce them together and see what the problem is. Um, a lot of times we do testing of asynchronous things, and this is the way you'll do it. You use this parameter done, and um, then when you call done, the test will be completed. If done is never called, then this test would fail, and it would say that it timed out. Um, and the default timeout for a Mocha test is two seconds. So if you need to increase that because your test takes a while, and it shouldn't take really too long, but if it does take longer, you can <clears throat> use this dot timeout and give some number of milliseconds to increase that. Uh, just a note, it's um, we're, we're using ECMA 6 here, but if you use if you use this dot timeout uh, at the time I wrote this slide, you have to go back and say function here. You can't use the the, the arrow. Um, so stubs, um, yeah, unit tests are about testing some small unit, some module on its own and making sure it works by itself. A lot of times these modules, they depend on stuff like a service or some other thing. Uh, in, this, in this picture here, this system under test is green, it's this green, green guy here, and, and he depends on these collaborators. Maybe that's like a service or something. But we just want to test this green guy. We don't really want to have these collaborators be involved in our test. We're, we're trying to focus in on this green part. So in order to do that, we can use some stubs or mock things out so that we can fake out this collaborator and we can like sort of stick in this fake thing and we sort of trick the system under test into thinking it's still talking to the collaborator, but really it's just giving some dumb fake data so it can do one particular thing and we can test and make sure it works. And so we use Sanon to do that. So um, here's an example at the top of a stub. They're, 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 they're pretty easy if you just sort of stick to this. I mean, I see a lot of people trying a lot of different things, but really there's not much to it. In, in your test, you would just import the thing that you want to stub out. And um, like a lot of our components might talk to a store, for instance. And that would be like that collaborator. And we just want to test the component. We don't really want to have the store involved in the test. So we might import the store, like a search store, and then we use Sanon to stub it out, to tell it we, we want this to be like a dummy. So we say Sanon.stub search store, and then we give the name of the function that we want to stub out. You can stub out an entire object, um, but in React there's certain things that maybe the system wants, and we happen to use Alt, which is um, similar to Redux, and, and, and it might have some certain things it wants. So I found that this works really well with, with stores. So you can, you can stub out a store, its get state method, and then here we're gonna have it just return some dumb data. So now if we wrote a test of our component, and it goes to talk to the store to get something, we're gonna shove in there and tell it, oh, here's what I wanted you to pretend that you got, just this ABC value. And it'll say, oh, okay, I got some data from the store, and I can continue to run, and then we can check to make sure the component did what it needs to. And that way the store isn't involved in the test. And then there's this other thing, a spy, and you set it up sort of like a stub. We have this um, component here that we're going to set up, and we're going to spy on it. And we say sanon.spy, we give the name of the component, and then we say we want to spy on the render method. It turns out when you're giving these React components, you gotta say prototype to get down to the, the methods that you wanna spy or stub out. You could stub this or spy on this. But so this is gonna be an example that we're going to spy on this component called multi-line text. We're gonna spy on its render method. And so then if we do that, and then our test runs and we're rendering the multi-line text component, 
at the end of it, maybe we did certain things and we expect it that it had better have rendered three times. So here we can we can do a call count on it to make sure that it actually did render, that the render method was called three times. So you can do things like um, make sure that it got the exact parameters you wanted, make sure that it got some parameters, make sure it was called one time or as many times as you like, or that it wasn't called. You can verify that as well. Um, so those are really helpful. And um, at the end of your test, you know, in that after each or the after part where you're tearing things down, this is where you would restore those stubs because once you do a line like this up here where you stub this or you spy on this, that's going to be in effect and other things that are going to use that, that module, they're going to get that faked out dumb data. So, so you're going to restore those at the end of your test. Um, we also use the Karma test runner in our environment, and um, it's a little bit heavyweight, but we do it because we're building all these React components, and we build them all so that they, they run in the browser. There are our web applications, and we use the great dev tools in Chrome. So we write our, our application, and we debug them. We go into Chrome, we set breakpoints, we do all this stuff, and it's a great environment to see how the app is running. Well, when we write our test, we want to have that same debugging capability because tests can be sometimes difficult to write, and they have bugs, and you want to go in and make sure your test is right, working right, and it'll step into the application itself. So when we run with Karma, we can get our, we can get our, um, our tests running in the, in the web browser and continue to use those dev tools. Also, we have this phantom browser down here. Um, that is a headless browser in case you're going to run in like a continuous integration and deployment environment and you want to run your tests one time without a browser coming up and make sure all the tests pass and if they do, then the next step of deployment can happen. So we have these two lines in our package.json for our, our widgets. So if we just say npm test, we'll do this first thing here and we'll run with phantom and it says single run true, so it'll run the test one time, and it'll report on whether they failed or whether they succeeded, and it could go on and do something else in our deployment. But if we're developing our tests and writing tests and debugging them, we're probably going to run this right here. We'll run npm run test dash dev. And we'll do that, and we'll tell it we want it to run in Chrome instead of this headless phantom JS browser. And we want to say single run is false. And so then we can start debugging our tests, and we can debug our application as the tests call into our application. And um, we can make changes. If we find problems, we can fix those. And then it'll hot deploy, and we'll be able to just refresh our page and continue to debug. That's really great, because Karma's kind of heavyweight. And when you start it, it takes a while to come up. And if every time you want to make a change and then get back to where you could debug stuff, it's kind of a pain. So. This, this is a really cool way to do it, um, that you can run it and just hot deploy and keep debugging your tests until you get them all right. We also use the React test utils, as I mentioned. And these are for manipulating the virtual DOM and checking on it, seeing how things are working when things are rendered. And um, there's, these are the different kind of mechanisms that we use. You can render into document a component. Like here, we're going to render into document the search widget component. And that'll do a full render. That means it'll render the search widget. And all its children component will, yeah, its children will all be rendered as well. And then there's the shallow renderer. It's a little bit different. So we're going to also render the search widget here using the shallow renderer. And that means it's going to render just the search widget at the top level. It's not going to render any children. That's a good thing if you're just trying to focus on you know, one component and not any of its children. And then once we've rendered these things, some of the other stuff that we do from time to time, we'll go and we'll use the test utils to find something in the component. Like here, we're going to find a DOM component with tag A. We're looking for this component has one anchor, and we're looking for it, and we found it. Sometimes we'll either look up by tag, but mostly we look up things by class. They have several of these. There's ones to look up an array of things. But pretty much these are the two that we mostly use. And this, this one here, that's what we use almost all the time. We look stuff up by class. And once we found something, we could do something like simulate a click on it or simulate a blur and make sure that our component's reacting to it properly. 
I also mentioned that we use this framework called Unexpected React. And it's a test utility for React, and it's a plugin for Unexpected. And we think it's really great for testing React components. It has a simple API that uses just the JSX and has these four functions. It has queried for, to contain, to have rendered with event. We don't really pay attention to most of those. We just use to contain, almost all the time, to contain. And we use also not to contain. Uh, it's really good at showing um, color-coded diffing of things that, that don't pass and trying to offer up suggestions as to what's wrong. But most importantly, it allows for writing forgiving and lenient tests so that your JSX doesn't have to match exactly what's in your component. I'm going to talk to you guys more about that. And first, I'm going to just show you like some of the error output. So here is like a simple test. It's just going to have this, this component called foo. It's a React component. And it doesn't do much except for just return a div with a, a class and some content, Brian. And then we're going to use our test utils to render into document this component foo. And then here's the test. We're going to make an assertion with unexpected React. We're going to say, we expect the component to contain a div with this class called multiline ellipsis. But you can see up here, we, it was really having a class called multiline plane. So that would fail. And it does fail. So you get this output. And it says, we expected the component foo with all this stuff in it to contain a div with multiline ellipsis. But the best match, it failed. And the best match was this div with class multiline plane. And it tries to tell you, hey, you're missing this class multiline ellipsis. So it points out to you what could be wrong. It's real easy to read. Um, and then here's another one um, where we're just um, same, same exact component. And we're going to render it. And we're going to expect the component to contain some content that's going to have a div with the word Hardy in it, my last name. And again, it has an error because we have content Brian in here. And so you get this color-coded output. We expected the component foo with all this stuff here to contain a div with Hardy. And the best match was this div that had Brian. But right here, it's telling you we expected Hardy to show up here. And that's why we failed. So it really points out what's wrong, what could be wrong. It's very helpful. So we like it for that, those, those kind of error messages, the color coding, making it easy to read. We also like, like I said, that it allows you to provide lenient tests. And so let's examine what that means here. Here's that foo component again. Same thing, it's a div, it's got this class, and got some content. We're going to render it into document. And we're going to make an assertion. We expect the component to contain exactly what was put into it. So yeah, that passes. All these assertions are going to pass. This one passes because it has a brittle, a brittle assertion. It's exactly what's in the component. Then we say, well, we expect it to contain foo. Yes, it's a foo. OK, that passes. We expect it to contain a class name, multi-line plane. Yes, so here we've left out uh, the content. We just have the class name. That passes. That's good. Here we say, we just want it to contain a div. That's good. Here we just want to contain a div with this content, Brian. And here's another one. So they all pass. And that's good. So imagine that really this component was important to you, and all you really cared about was that this component was going to output Brian as its content. That was the important part of this component. So you might use a test like this one down here, this second from the bottom. And that, that's, that's a more lenient test. You're saying, I don't care about its styles or other things. It just better have this content. So here we've got another test where we're going to modify our component. Somebody on our team came in, and they, they made a parent div, and they changed this class to another class because it's got a different theme now. Well, it still had Brian in it. And so here's our test, expect component to contain div Brian. It's still passing because what we really cared about in that test was to make sure this component better put out Brian, and it did. So even though people went in and modified stuff, the test passed, and that's great. So if we had this more brittle test that it matched the JSX exactly, it would have broken. We would have to go change the test, and it would be a real pain. So there's another utility out there that's real popular. Um, it's called Enzyme. And it's kind of like Unexpected React. It's a test utility for React. And it's from Airbnb. And it has this jQuery-like syntax. And unlike Unexpected React, which is tied to Unexpected, 
This one uh, doesn't tie into any kind of assertion framework. So um, I made these slides, I don't know, maybe five months ago, and at the time, Enzyme was, was very popular. It's probably gotten more popular, but you know, there's 6,200 people that favorited it. They really like it. But look at poor little unexpected React, only 105 people. Not many people like it. But we do, we think it's great. And we like it because of those lenient tests. We like to write our tests so that, that we use JSX in our, in our test because our components use JSX and it's easy for us to read and it's the way we work. And so we wanna have our tests. We don't wanna use jQuery-like syntax like you might see in Enzyme or that you might get from, I'll get your question later, or that you might get, um, that you might, you might react, react utils, you can, you can do some API with that too, the React test utils. And we don't wanna do that, we wanna provide JSX uh, that mimics what we have in our component and we wanna write lenient tests that don't break. So here we are looking at Enzyme, and like I said, this slide was made um, five months ago, maybe they've improved things, but at the time I wrote this, Take a look at this foo, comp this foo um, component that you're familiar with now, and you can see here we're gonna use Enzyme, we're gonna mount this thing, and I haven't used Enzyme a lot, I'll tell you, I just cursory looked at it, but um, here they are, and they're, they're gonna look and see that this brittle test passes. Everything is in there, yeah, it's true. It's a foo, yeah, that's true. It contains a div with Brian, uh, it fails, it fails, it can't do that. So you can't write as lenient a test if that was you know, what you wanted to do. And here it's just saying it contains a div and that failed as well. Whereas unexpected react, all these tests here, they, they pass. And, and we, I think I showed you how we wanted to have that more lenient test with just Brian in it. Um, and here's another example at the bottom of not to contain. So this component does not contain an anchor. You had a question? I was curious um, where the uh, compiling of the JSX is happening. Are you running that, um, is Unexpected doing that, or do you run it through uh, Babel with Webpack or something like that? Is it out of the box with those libraries is what I'm asking. Yeah, we use Webpack and we've got lots of Babel and our expert in that area has a bad headache today. Maybe he's listening, I don't know, but he's not here, otherwise he could tell you all about Webpack and Babel. Mm -hmm. I get in there every now and then, but I hate that stuff. So you, you transpile these files before they're, they're run? Yeah. Okay, thank you. That's the not so fun part of React and ECMO 1.6, and I don't like all that. Um, yeah, so um, that was a great talk earlier from Peter with the, the Redux. I have never used Redux. Um, we use Alt, and I think it's fantastic. It's a great environment. Um, so we use uh, Flux stores in our environment, and so we wanna have tests for those stores, and so I brought one up here to show you that's a common pattern we use to test things in our store. Um, let's take a look here. So uh, we've got our store we've imported, and with all, we have our actions that we can dispatch. And this is gonna be a asynchronous test here. We got done here. And what we wanna test is it should publish an event and set an error after an errant search. So we're gonna try and do a search and it's supposed to have an error and it's supposed to publish an event and set an error when that happens. So it pretty much tells you like a book, what is this supposed to do? It's a nice way to have an acceptance criteria, I think. I like it. So. Anyway, we start out here in, um, let's see, do we have a before here? No, we don't. Um, here we have our command, and we're gonna issue this action called fetch result, and it's gonna have a payload of data page one. So we're gonna try and fetch from our search service, we're gonna try and fetch page one. Presumably there's already something that's set what the query terms are. Maybe it's in some data or something, but Anyway, so since this, since our, when, whenever using alt, we have these things called sources, and the source is used to go off and get data asynchronously. 
And so we use the module fetch inside there. So it's going to go fetch something from a URL. Um, there's a, a counterpart, and that's called fetch mock. And it's a way to mock out the, the fetch. And it's, it's built with Sanon. And so we're going to use that here. But we're going to issue this command that's going to do a fetch. And it's going to ultimately go and hit this URL, searchservice.intuit.com. And that's not real, so don't try and hit that. And, and it's going to go through there. And we're telling it, we're telling this mock. Remember, a mock is the stub. It's this thing that's going to do something fake. It's going to do some dumb thing. And we're going to tell it, hey, when you're in there and you try and go get this data, we want you to return a 404 status. And the code doesn't know that we faked it out, but it's going to go through the, the part of the code where it says, oh, I got a 404, I got an error. And so I can tell you that our code, when it gets that, what it's going to do is, is fire off an event that says, oh, search results fetch failed. We put out an event so our, our clients can listen for that and maybe react to it or do something with it. So, so we set up this fetch mock, and then we go ahead, and here we are, we're going to dispatch our command. It says, go ahead and do a fetch. And it goes into our store, and that ultimately goes to our source, and it hits that URL, it tries to get data, and it gets a 404, and it goes, oh, I got a 404. And then so it fires off this event, hopefully, and then this emitter that we've set up, it's going to listen one time, it's going to listen for this event. And so it got that event, it came in here, just for fun, we make sure fetch mock was called. And then we're going to get the store state. We're going to get the state from the store. And we're going to make sure that in that state, we set the field error in there. And it's got some other stuff in there about what went wrong, but we just want to make sure an error was set. And then we said, we're done. So if we, if we dispatch this command, and we're listening here, and it comes in here, and it does these things, and it says done, we know we passed. If it didn't come in here, It'll time out and say, I never got anything, and we'll know it failed. If it came in here and the payload wasn't right or the store state didn't have error in it, it would fail, and we'd find out it failed. So that is kind of the main thing we do in our store test. We fire an action, and then we, we have the URL do something, the, the source return something, and um, we, we, we see the results in the state. So fire an event, an action, and look at the state and see if it's what you think it is. That's what we do commonly. Now we use alt, so I'll just tell you anybody using it, you can you can do a um, you can do an unwrapped store. And so if there's methods inside of your store, you can test those in an unwrapped state. Um, so yeah, you can look that up. And I'll leave my name at the end if you guys have any problems or want to learn more about this stuff or need any help about React in general or Testing, you can you can hit me up. So that's the store test. Um, now I wanted to go over with you uh, one of our component tests. But before I do, I'm going to show you what this component is. So this is one of our um, search components here. So you can search in here and get some results. And uh, we can expand this, and you can see uh, this area here. This, this, I don't know if you can see it out there, but there's a little ellipsis there. Can you see that? Maybe not. Well, there's an ellipsis there. And, and as you drag it, um, the ellipsis is moving along, and then it disappeared. Or, or the gray one. There, there it goes. It, it disappeared. Not yet. There it goes. It's gone. So it's gone, it comes back. It, it's meant to show the user, it's meant to give them feedback that, hey, there's more content here. And so um, our back end normally is supposed to give out like 1,300 characters of snippet. And if you want to expand, you get to have more data. And if there's more than three lines, it's going to put this ellipsis on there to let the user know, oh, if you expand, you can look at more data. And then if we have a smaller snippet, the ellipsis doesn't show up. So it's kind of a cool component we put together, and that's that multi-line text component. Um, it's mostly a, <clears throat> a CSS solution, but there's, there's part of it that, that works with React, and we're going to look at the tests that we have uh, in React. Um, maybe I'll show you the code for it first. So, I think you guys can all see that. It's pretty big, right? 
So this is our multi-line text component. And let's take a look at what it does. When, it, when it's mounted, it's going to listen for a resize event, like you saw me dragging the window. And it's going to call this handle resize when, when, re, when resize is happening. And here's handle resize. It's just going to see if it was already working and clear out a timer and start timing again. Because it'll do it for like 100 milliseconds to let you drag a little and then know you've stopped. But ultimately, it's going to call another function called width update. And here's width update. Width update is going to see if the content overflowed. And then it's going to get the state of the, the ellipsis, and it's going to toggle it. If it was off, it's going to turn it on. If it's on, it's going to turn it off, I guess, based on whether it's overflowed. Not overflowed, and it's showing, then don't show it. If you've overflowed and we're not showing it, then show it. So, And in case anybody doesn't know, there's the magic words right there. I always say the magic words. Anytime you're in the store and you call set state, or when you're in a component and you call set state, <clears throat> that's the magic words that says, re-render. Something happened. It's time for you to get ready to redraw. So this method is calling content overflowed. And we broke it out here into this other method. And here it is. It's looking to see if the scroll height went higher than the content height. So that's just a way of seeing if it overflowed. So here we are in our render method, and it's going to get this style. It's either going to be show, it's going to get the state of the show ellipsis. And let's see, can I, how can I show this? I don't have my wheel to do this. Well, it's either going to show a multi-line plane style, or it's going to show a multi-line ellipsis style. So those are the that's the CSS part. So multi-line ellipsis or multi-line plane here. So it's figuring out based on the state of the ellipsis, which one am I going to show? And then it's going to use that um, that style uh, right here. And then it's just going to show the content. So back to our test. What does it do? Well, we've got unexpected React in here. You have to import these first. They have to be at the top. And then we've got our test utils, and we've got our component, our multi-line text component. And we've got our styles that we have in our multi-line text dot, this PCSS here. <clears throat> so here we are setting our test up, and we've got, we've got a content overflowed stub. And we've got a multi-line text render spy. So our content overflowed stub, we're going to call it sanon.stub, multi-line text prototype, content overflowed. So we're going to set up the, the content overflowed function to return false. So in all our tests, by default, they're going to start out that overflowed is going to be not be true. And then we're going to set up this spy, this multi-line uh, text render spy. And at the bottom, after each, we're going to restore them like we talked about before. So let's see. Here we are. We're in this. It's test says, it re-renders when the ellipsis is not showing and the content overflowed. So we go ahead and we render the multi-line text component. And we make sure that when we rendered it, it went, or that, that when we yeah, rendered it in a document, that it did, in fact, call the render method. Remember, this is our, this is our render spy on the multi-line text component render method. So we're making sure, yep, it called render one time, just like it should have, because we, we rendered it. And then here in our test, we're going to set the content overflowed stub to say return true. Now when anything calls that method, it's just going to return true, because it's got some dumb value. And then here, we're, we're going to manually um, invoke the method width update. Since we don't have any way to really be like dragging and resizing here, that would be like a Selenium test to do that. So we're going to manually call this method. And you remember, it's going to call content overflowed in there. Did you guys remember that? You want to go back to it. It calls that method. And since we've stubbed it out here, since we stubbed it out here, it's going to return true. <clears throat> so we're going to call this width update. And we're going to make sure that that caused it to render. So render had better be called twice. That's true. And then we're going to expect that this component should contain 
its, its content, plus it better have the style multi-line ellipsis instead of multi-line plane because, yes, it overflowed. That tells us that it got too big. It, it went beyond three lines of text, so we're going to put the multi-line in there. So, question then. So yeah. you said on the second one it called twice. Is it because it called it first? The render was called first during the first line, and then the second time it was called, it's called twice? Because it, render shouldn't be called twice just because you updated the width, right? Well, um, actually, it should. We'll, we'll go back and look at it. First, it rendered. Are you okay with this one? It rendered it yeah, once. Yeah, yeah. It rendered should call document. render once. Okay. And then... Why would it call render twice the second time? Then? Well, let's see, because we're going we're gonna to force it to call width update, okay? There's width update, and it's going to call this over content overflowed method. Now, we forced that with, with our, with our um, stub. We forced it to say true. It overflowed. Overflowed means that the content got bigger than three lines. It went into four lines. It didn't fit in there anymore, and it goes, ooh, i got to trim that off, and i got to put the ellipsis on there. So... We stubbed that out to return true. So this is going to be true. And it's going to say, if content overflowed, true, and we were not showing an ellipsis, which we were not, then we're going to call the magic word set state that says, re-render, re-render. Right. And we've that's got our right. state set to ellipsis true. So that's going to cause it to render again. That's going to cause it to render once. Yeah, but in this test, it will have rendered twice. Uh, because it's the second time in correct. this test. That's what I was asking. Yeah, correct. Sorry, I didn't get that. But yeah, that's going to cause it to render and go get that style that we expect. That's why it rendered twice. And that's why we ended up getting this style down here. Um, how are we doing on time? OK. Um, we could go over this one up here, but it's pretty similar. This is just like, I think it's like, uh, it displays an overflowed snippet with an ellipsis on creation. So when you create um, a, a, a multi-line text component, uh, if overflowed stub was true and you render it once, it better contain multi-line ellipsis. So it's just making that was making sure that you know the first time we loaded this thing and it mounted, we called width update off right off the bat, so it can check and say, oh, was I loaded and this content was already too big? Because if so. I'm going to set that style with that ellipsis. That, that's what that other test is checking for. So those are two of, two of our tests for that component, and that's how they work. Um, I know we've gone over a lot of stuff, and um, I hope it was beneficial to you guys. And um, if you want to reach out to me about anything about React or immutability or alt, I love alt, um, or... Um, testing, please feel free to reach, reach me here. Um, thank you very much. Do you guys have any questions? So, so I'm one of those people that actually uses an enzyme. Um, enzyme? My question was, when I'm writing enzyme tests, I'm using a JS DOM as a headless browser. JS DOM? Yeah. Okay. When you're doing an unexpected with unexpected React was that uh, use clone line where you're saying Does it use what? Could you raise that up a little? Or pull it out of there? The unexpected uh, use clone unexpected React or whatever line it was, you know the one I'm talking about? Uh, let's see. Right in, right in here? Uh, forward. It was the second to last slide. Second to last slide. Uh, back one. Uh, the third line. Yeah, okay, yeah. Is that kind of setting up a headless browser with a virtual DOM, or? No. Um, well, uh, you know, I don't know. Maybe, maybe I don't, I'm not really sure what it's doing. I think it's just saying, use unexpected, and I'm shoving in, I'm injecting this unexpected React into the unexpected library. So you call it using unexpected, and it's going through the normal unexpected flow, but unexpected React is sort of, uh, injected in there. I think that's what it's what it's really doing. Okay. We we use Phantom JS and we were writing some Selenium tests, and um, we couldn't use the headless browser of Phantom JS. It, it couldn't handle React. So right now we're just using Chrome, and it's you're seeing the Selenium test run, and we have yet to 
find a better headless browser. I'm sure there's some out there or some coming that, that we'll use. It's usually that a JS DOM works really well with Enzyme. Which JS DOM. Okay, thank you. You'll be happy to know that Unexpected now has 121 likes or stars on GitHub. So it's growing. More, yes, you're you're uh, you're advertising. We'll get that well. word out. We'll get that word I'm out. I'm sure. I'm sure Same other people here. Alt. Sorry. <laughs> but do do you uh, does Intuit or do you worry about a library that has so little use and and continued um, support for it? It does seem like it's it's being actively maintained. Doesn't have a lot of uh, traffic on there. And do you guys contribute to that sort of? That's a code? great question. And yes, we do worry about it. I was looking around trying to figure out how to do this kind of stuff, and at first we did more just React test utils things, and we kind of built the code in a way. It was, it was all right, but it wasn't that readable, and we stumbled across some other tool, and they were doing, you had to have the exact JSX in there, and we're like, well, that sucks. And then we stumbled across uh, unexpected React, said, well, well, that seems like it's a lot better, and we started using it and going, yeah, it's great. And, and I, I talked to um, our, our lead, Austin, and I said, well, um, it's not used by a lot of people, and everybody's going crazy on enzyme, enzyme, enzyme. And we looked it over, and we, we made some tests, and we said, yeah, it's better. We, we, we want to do this, and we want to have these lenient tests. That's what's important to us. And luckily, he's, he's really a bright guy, and, and he's confident. He goes, we're using it. And I've written to the author before about some issues we had, and he got right back to me. Very helpful. So. Um, yeah, it's a little bit scary, but um, I think it's a great tool. And the second part is, are, do you guys contribute to that code base, and are you willing to take it over if it some, for some reason died? I don't know. The guy that's doing it seems pretty involved and, and doing a really good job and very up-to-date and answering stuff. And um, uh, I, I, Yeah, I don't know if, if we would take it over. I'm, I'm a contractor, guys. I'm con contracting as a principal software engineer here, so... Um, Luckily, I don't have to make those kind of decisions. Cool. All right. You know how we are. We just do a bunch of cool stuff, and they go, I got to go. <laughs> um, just, that's just a kidding, kidding. Um, any, any other questions? Anything? Here we go. Here we go. This is going to be a good one. I can tell. <laughs> so when you said the widget library, how do you manage the CSS stuff? Is it totally self-contained or the yeah. CSS framework? Yeah, yeah. Um, Austin, who's not here with this raging headache tonight, has put together a lot of framework for it, and it's really cool. We have um, we start out with a delivery mechanism that's not um, npm based. We make um, a bundle, a JS bundle, and people can get it, and then we have an API into it that they can use in JavaScript. And we package everything up, and it comes in the bundle. We're going to be moving toward just doing all npm, but we use uh, PCSS, and we have all of our um, we use CSS modules, and we have everything encapsulated. We have a CSS file per component that does everything we need. Once in a while, we might have to use something global, but we try not to. Um, we test these things, and we try and get them as, as ready as we can. But like I said, they get dropped into environments. And then people have their own framework like Bootstrap or some people will use Harmony and something else. And it can conflict and it can cause problems. And then we've kind of got to go and tweak it and we've got to reset CSS to make sure their, their styles aren't bothering ours. You know, we hope to one day get to like web components that are going to encapsulate and protect all of our, our CSS. But right now we don't really have that. So um, it has been a little bit of an issue. We're going to try and go to more of an open source model where we have our widgets, and they're sort of like open source, and if you want them, you get a base version, and then you kind of tweak it and make it look how you want. And if you have you know, CSS problems, well, you'll do that. But right now, we're kind of making sure everything fits in real good, because we're new, and we want people to accept these widgets and build up a following before we can you know, have people um, more on board with it. Did, did I answer your question? Any, anything else? Eric, I know you have a question. <laughs> OK. Well, thank you, guys. Um, we're doing a lot of cool stuff. Uh, I, I really like what we're doing. And uh, I was thinking about talking about some immutability when we didn't have our other speakers show up. But um, 
uh, immutability is a really great thing, as Peter touched on, and we use it to, uh, to make our, our widgets more performance. And Alt is another great tool, but I will leave it at that. If you guys would like, reach me right there. Thank you very much.